On the next episode of Painting and Travel, Sarah visits a sea turtle rescue facility near St. Augustine, Florida. Back in his studio, Roger paints a portrait using acrylics of a loggerhead turtle. I'm so glad you could join me. It's a beautiful day. And after Roger gets a really good start on his painting, we're going to the lab, the Whitney Marine Lab, and find out what happens to turtles that have been rescued and need some help. It's part of the University of Florida, and there's much research that goes on here, as well as education. I'll be painting a loggerhead turtle today, and I have a variety of brushes here. These are synthetic brushes and uh, I'll be using acrylics. I have a few flats, fan brush, which I may or may not use, and a small pointed brush for a few details later on. Here are my acrylics. I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, Indian yellow, alizarin crimson, and then these three earth colors, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, burnt umber, and I have one green, which is a chromium oxide green. I'll basically be using these three earth colors here and maybe some cerulean blue primarily. I'm also using an 11 by 14 inch masonite board and I've drawn it on here to give myself a, a start. And uh, of course this board is toned with gesso and often I tone my board to begin with. In this case I, I have not. Uh, I'm going to put just a thin coat, a background coat here of a well, sort of a light blue with some cerulean blue, some yellow ochre, and a touch of white. I just want to put a little bit of a color on this board. I'll pick up a few other colors here too, maybe some ultramarine blue. And I'll just wash these in here. Well, I also have my atomizer here with me. This is a very important tool that I use in my kit keeps my board wet and my paints wet. Now I don't think I want much color up in this area because the shell of this turtle is going to be dark. So I'm just going to almost work this as if it were a watercolor to begin with. I think that may have been a bit too wet so I'm just going to wipe some of that off. Now this turtle is very dark so I'll pick up my burnt umber, some ultramarine blue, and maybe a touch of alizarin crimson. We'll get these dark colors in here first. Now this drawing I have in here, of course I'm going to lose that as I put these dark colors in. So basically I just want to get these dark areas laid in here first. And then I'll put my lights over my darks after I get these darks established. These are just beautiful creatures. I've painted a number of them in the past. Here are a few of them that I've done before. And these are uh, different species of turtles. And even though I had a fairly accurate drawing on here, as I said earlier, I'm going to lose a lot of that. But the purpose of making an accurate drawing to begin with is just so I familiarize myself with the subject. And there's a lot of detail that goes down in here as well. And I didn't draw any of that because I knew I would be painting this dark color first, and I would just lose that drawing totally. Now I'm just staying with this burnt umber and ultramarine blue, and then I'll take my brush and just flatten that out. I don't want very much texture in there. Now right up near the turtle's head, I'll take some white, cerulean blue, and some more yellow ochre, and I think I'll just paint this whole head in this yellow ochre color, this warm tone. Now I can still see my uh, drawing through here. Now if I were painting dark colors over this I would lose that drawing but these 
lighter colors, they uh, just show through and I can still see my pencil lines. And then we have a bit of a warmer color right under his neck right here. So I probably need to add that because it's not very much color at all in this piece here. So any color I can add I think will be beneficial. Just give it a little more life, you know. Okay, some uh, more burnt umber, ultramarine blue. And then really I can start putting in these dark patches here of the turtle. Now, acrylics don't always cover very well. They just don't cover as well as oils do. So in order for this to look good, I may have to put two layers of this on here. Two layers of paint. I'm trying to put this on as heavy as I can, but still it may not cover <laughs> that well to get that nice flat look. The other thing I can do, of course, after I load my brush up and put it on here is just with a light touch, just sort of give that a light touch and flatten that out so I don't see the actual brush stroke. Pick up a little more of this dark color. Well, while I'm on this palette, let me mention a few things about how I arrange my palette here. I often do put more colors on, sometimes less colors, but I always arrange my palette in a way where I know where all my colors are so I don't have to really search for them. That's why I put my earth colors together and then my primary colors here, blue, yellow, and red. So that way when I go to pick up a color, I don't have to hunt all around the palette for it. And the other important thing for me is to have these paints at the very edge of my palette and not to put them in the middle of my palette. That leaves all this nice space here for actually mixing. Uh, if I were to put some of the white here and, and so on, uh, it would become much more confusing and uh, it would really slow down this whole process of painting. Now it was pretty skimpy with the paint in here and I may uh, rework that some. But in here I want to put in quite a bit of paint just so it covers as well as it can. And I don't have all those little spots drawn in, but I have most of them, so I have a pretty good guideline as to where to put them. I have this big eye here, so that's going to be very dark as well. And after I put this on, I'm going to let that dry, and then I'm going to put some highlights and reflections on that eye. Right now it's just a dark brown color, but later on I'll add some blue in here, not that he has a blue eye, he or she has a blue eye, but uh, that blue will be sort of a reflection from the sky. And again, that will just add some more color to this painting. I'm going to add a touch of white here, because right up here towards the front of the animal, it's catching more light. So this area right here, instead of having that very, very dark brown color, I'm going to make that lighter. And under his mouth, we have a little dark patch. Now I could use a small brush on this, but this is a fairly good brush, so it has a little chisel edge to it, so I can run that along here. Right under his mouth here, this is a slightly darker area. I picked up a larger brush for this. It's a little bit larger area. Now spraying my board like this, if I want to blend these two areas together, spraying that really helps because it just moistens the board just enough where I can wipe my brush off, have a dry brush, and I can just drag those colors one into another. Even though this is dry and this is wet, uh, I can just feather that wet paint into the dry paint very easily. I'm going to do the same under his neck here. This has already been sprayed, so it's a bit moist. And with a very light touch, I just flip that out. And that just blends that very nicely, very easily. I'll take that same color here and right under its I will do the same thing. Make that slightly darker. It just gives it some form. I'm going to put down my larger brushes now and pick up this small pointed brush. And uh, we'll start jumping in on these areas that are that have more detail. 
I like to use a larger brush for as long as I can. Just speeds the process up a little bit and uh, makes things easier all the way around. Okay, we have some creases in its neck. I think I'll spray this one more time. And those little creases in its neck. I'm just using a very light touch of my brush, just the tip of this brush. Pick up a little more paint. Paint's fairly thin, so it flows off the edge of my brush, off the tip of my brush. A few more, it's got a lot of wrinkles here. And some of those sort of come around this side to kind of disappear when they get around here. I'm going to jump back over here to the shell and these areas right in here, I need to get rid of that white. So just with some ultramarine blue and burnt umber again, I'll just fill these in. That way I can still see my large shapes that I need to put in there, but at the same time, they're not completely gone. Give me a little bit of a guideline or roadmap as to where those uh, parts of his shell need to be indicated. Now I think I'll work on the eye and repaint the center of that eye. Now it's very, very dark. It's, it's, it's actually black. And I, I really could have used black out here on my palette, but if I mix a few of these colors together, ultramarine blue, burnt umber, and maybe some uh, lizard and crimson, that will give me a very, very dark color. And really, if it's put on like this, if there's no white in there, I don't think you'd be able to tell the difference between that or had I put black in there. And that dark part of the eye would, of course, be right under this eyelid, so that's a very dark area too. Now I'll take some of my white and ultramarine blue and as I said earlier, I know that it doesn't have a blue eye. Its eyes aren't blue, but the, ref the eye is shiny, of course, so any reflection would be picked up by the, the eye there. And uh, this may be a reflection of the sky. Just put that blue on each side of the iris. And that really does define the, the eye itself. And with a touch of white, just a touch of white, small touch on my brush here. Just put a highlight right on the eye there. There we go. Let's move back into the shell some more. And uh, since this turtle would probably be wet, <laughs> even if we're out of the uh, water for a while, uh, I'm going to make these sh shells here reflect a little bit of what might be sky here. So I've got a blue, I'm going to put a blue cast on some of these shells. And of course that just adds some uh, nicer color to this piece. Because painting something like this is not always about just the local color. You know, it's this, you know, I know it has a brown shell, but there's a lot of influences that are going on with something like this, especially if it is wet. And of course one of those major influences would be the sky and the sun. So we'll just put some reflections here of what would be the sky. And maybe just a little more right down here. Could put a lot of detail in here. Well, now that'll happen in just a few minutes. Well, I'm pretty far along with this painting now, so I think this might be a good time to join Sarah. This is Katherine Eastman, and she is the coordinator for the rehabilitation and rescue of these wonderful sea creatures. How do most of them wind up here? So most of our sea turtles uh, are coordinated from the, the state Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Volunteers might be walking on the beach or just beachgoers out on the waterway and see an injured sea turtle. Well, these turtles, the sea turtles, they don't really leave the ocean for any reason except um, to, um, to make to a nest. nest. Right. The, uh, the only time the sea turtles come out to our beaches on purpose is for nesting. So if it's a sea turtle that's way too small to be a nesting female, there's another reason why he or she is washed in. And that's where we come in. Well, that's wonderful. So they can bring the turtle here or call and have 
it transported here, and you have a veterinarian on staff we have and a, many volunteers. We have volunteers, we have a veterinarian on staff, and, and we have some veterinary technicians on staff, and between our our, our team were able to triage an animal or um, admit them into our into our care. And the turtle gets a physical and they diagnose whether he has a, a virus or um, another illness? Basically that's correct. So a turtle comes in and, and gets a general physical and basic blood work run and we, we determine right away uh, if the turtle's dehydrated or suffering from uh, low glucose and, and all of the sea turtle veterinary medicine is very similar to small animal veterinary medicine. So uh, within the first several hours, um, we get the sea turtle comfortable and um, rehydrated. To look at them, they're wonderful looking creatures, but it's not fuzzy like a dog or a cat. So, but do you feel affection for them? The basic answer to that is yes, not in the fuzzy way that you would uh, with a dog or a cat but there's something graceful and wild about them, seeing them swimming uh, it, or feeding. It, it just, you almost feel privileged to be able to experience that, well, even I, in a tank. Yes, I feel that way now because it's almost as if this uh, creature is flying and um, it's something we can't do, so there's an aspect of mystery Definitely. for me just to watch one. And they're gentle. If you are scuba diving or snorkeling and you come close to one, these, these are not vicious in no. any way. No, they, they probably won't even approach you. They'll probably ignore you and you can just sort of be in the moment with an amazing prehistoric creature. Have you noticed, does it take a special person to care for the creatures? Because even though you may have a love for them intellectually, there's always a bit of uh, grit and blood and other elements <laughs> to caring for an exotic That's, creature. Yes, there is definitely a personality in the people that, that spend hours. Is there a lot of joy when you have one and he's healthy and you can release him? Is that kind of a, an yes. aha moment, a celebration? It's, it's amazing. It is especially, even the short-term ones that maybe we've had for several months, um, or an animal that, that we've had many months. It's definitely exciting because we get the public involved and to have a, a big send off off the beach. And you have school children come, don't you, and um, learn? We do have a K through 12 program at the Whitney Laboratory and a day at the Whitney is, is one of the programs and there's fifth graders here today learning about ex doing experiments and basically being a scientist for the day. And it's such a beautiful location here. It's really quite incredible. You have an estuary out estuary back. Estuary out back and the ocean in the front. Are there only seven species of sea turtles? Yes, there are seven species of sea turtles globally. And Florida, we've seen six of those seven. We typically see five of those seven. Who's been your largest patient so far? Our largest patient, like physically sized, would be Banana, who's a, a sub-adult green sea turtle uh, named from the Banana River, so that's a couple hours south of us. And she's a 70, 75 pound green turtle. But that's definitely a wild animal that was healthy when she or he was hit by a, a boat propeller. Oh, so it's damaged the shell. Damaged the to shell. To a degree that it might not heal up on its own. Right, or definitely needed our, our help, our intervention. So yes, banana is the largest one that I think all of us have had to work with. Here. I guess it takes a few people to lift banana out, maybe a hoist or something. <laughs> much bigger than that and much stronger than that, I, I think we'll be looking at more, at new staff, <laughs> stronger, stronger staff. Catherine, thank you for your time. And I'm going to look around some more before we leave today. Sounds great. And I'd love to come back another time. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Well, I still have a lot more detail to work on here. I've got all the basics down, which is the important thing. Get these big areas and some of the small ones. Let's continue on with the detail. And this is really a, a side view of this the creature. But uh, right over here, I'm seeing a little bit of the other side of the turtle. So this is not a three-quarter view. It's really a side view, but I can see just a little bit around the edge there. And here's his other eye right here. 
So it just sort of pops up there and protrudes slightly. I'll put that in. I think I need to add a few highlights in here. This color here, this sort of background color is, is all pretty much the same. I do have some dark areas here, but let me add a few lighter tones up here. So I'll just take my white and for instance, right here on the top, this might be catching more sunlight. So I'll just take my white and highlight a few of these areas. Jump back over to the shell now, some burnt sienna. And I'll put some warm areas up here at the top of its shell. Because this is the areas that are catching more sunlight. So this will be warmer, a, few, a little bit warmer color there. A touch of a yellow ochre. Just lighten that. Warm that color up. Sometimes colors like this, uh, even though maybe they're the same value, this is the same value, same lightness or darkness, when I say value, these are pretty much the same value, but this is warmer, so it does appear lighter, even if it's close to being the same value. It will appear lighter simply because it's warmer. And now for some more detail, and between the large plates of its shell back here, I'll mix up a uh, sort of a gray color. Don't want it pure white. Okay, now I'll just strike in some of these areas where the plates of this shell come together. And just using that very tip of my brush. And we've got some more coming down here. Some of these kind of fade away into almost nothing, but they're there. And right down in this area, there's a whole lot of, of these little diamond-shaped patterns. And I didn't draw those in there earlier because I would have just lost them with uh, this undercoat. And now we have his flipper here. And this is very interesting because this has some very beautiful patterns. Again, right here we're seeing the edge looking sort of straight on to this flipper. So we see larger patterns. So I'll put these larger ones in first. And then we'll go over towards the front. And of course, when they get more towards the front, they curve around. So perspective-wise, these get thinner. This painting is a whole lot about the detail. Many of the paintings I do are more about the large areas, but this one really happens to be more about, more about detail. But of course, it was very important to get these large shapes in first. Got to start with the large areas first and then work towards the details. But those large areas went very fast. Didn't take too much to get those established. All right, let's go back down here and we'll highlight a few of the areas on this flipper. So right down here, maybe this the light is catching this area more. So I'll pick up my white, add a touch of yellow ochre to that, and I'll just fill in a few of these areas, especially where these areas intersect. That sort of gives that highlight right around where the light might be hitting that. Give it some form and roundness. I'm going to pick up some ultramarine blue here and on the bottom of his eye, just put some pure ultramarine blue and it's not going to show up much I won't even notice it on the screen, but just adds a touch more color, a little bit more life there. Put a few more highlights right on its shell. Now for the finest detail in here, right between these areas, there's another thin line. So just at the very tip of my brush, let's add that very, very fine line right between those areas. It's just a very, very fine, almost a pencil line. In fact, on a painting like this, it wouldn't be out of the question just to use a pencil on this. Even though this is an acrylic painting, I have used a pencil before on a painting like this to maybe indicate uh, telephone lines, electrical lines, that sort of thing. And that might be an easier way to do it, but this is not, this is not difficult. 
Well, I think to finish this painting, I just need to work on this background more. It looks a little weak. I think I'll take a darker color, some ultramarine blue, maybe a touch of, um, a touch of burnt sienna, and some white, because what I want to do here, since this looks very thin and weak, I want to add white to this to give it some body. And I'll just give some painterly strokes here. Now, I don't have to have that totally flat. I, I do want the strokes to show up right under its chin. I can have that slightly darker because dark against light will help that to show up. So let's have that slightly darker there. And then we'll grab the white again and we'll just, just with a big broad strokes of the brush, just redo this background. I don't want to be fussy at all with this background. I just want it to have some painterly strokes in here. So I don't want to dab, dab, dab. I just want to get that laid on there and leave it alone. Up towards the top, I'll make that slightly warmer. Grab the white, some uh, yellow ochre. And I'll just put that on there. Lay that on there. Don't want to fuss with it. If I were to really pick and pick at this, I would start to get some sort of a detail in there, even if it were, even if it were just the detail of the strokes. And that might take away from the detail here. So I don't want any detail up there whatsoever, just larger strokes. Cut around his shell right down there. So I think that will finish this, and it's been a pleasure. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Batsimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.